Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. My name is Betty, and I am a grateful alcoholic. Hi, I don't think you got enough Kleenex up here. <laughs> Um, I would like to thank the committee and uh, Andrew especially for offering me to be of service um, to my own sobriety today. I hope to do honor to this group. I um, remember when people were talking about forming this group, and I very much honor this group and for everything that it stands for. So I hope to do it justice today. Um, I know that uh, as long as I end up speaking to one alcoholic, that my job here is done today. So. With that, it makes it a lot easier to know that I don't have to make up anything. It's all my story. And uh, welcome, welcome to Saturday. Woohoo! This is my lunch break. I'm so grateful. This is my lunch break, people. I, I am so grateful to be able to um, do this today. I really, really, really look forward to this because, um, as I'll get into later, I've got a new position in life and I'm in a new stat- stature in life where I'm working a lot and not used to that and I'm not getting the t- amount of time that I used to get for this. So I can, I, I'm grateful to be standing up here today. Um, did I say my name? My name is Betty. I am a grateful alcoholic. Um, my sobriety date is March 2nd of 2000, and my home group is the Citrus Heights Group of Alcoholics Anonymous, which meets on Wednesdays at 8 p.m. at, we just moved. Yeah, yeah, what she said. Um, I know the old address, that's not going to do any good. Um, I'm of service to my home group, and I've been a home group member there for, for many years, and uh, I hold a position in that group, and I attend that group regularly. I am also actively sponsored, um, and if, I know this group knows what active sponsorship is because you guys are hammer time when it comes it comes to that meeting and greeting people outside the door, and I honor that. Thank you very much. Um, I'm of service to uh, my district, my home group, and our area in Alcoholics Anonymous. <sighs> So uh, uh, the 12th suggestion is what I'm going to try to touch on a little bit. Um, I don't know how you guys think you're going to get me for an hour of yakking, but um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my experience, strength, and hope uh, with uh, about my re- journey of recovery and, um, and about the 12th suggestion. So what I would like to do is give you just a little bit of history of what it was like because we do have an hour to fill. Um, I was born uh, of older parents. My mom was born in 1925, and my dad was born in 1918. And um, I was my mom's sixth, and I was my dad's one and only. And um, none of the other kids lived with us. And it was just me, my mom, and my dad. And I love you was said a thousand times a day in my house. And I was loved, and I was fed, and I was cherished, and I was clothed, and I was told that I could uh, be and do anything, and I was nurtured. And um, I grew up with a lot of I love yous. I don't know if my parents were alcoholics. I don't know what went on in their brain before they took their first drink. Um, But I know that there was always alcohol at the house. There was a lot of, um, we had an organ at the house, and there used to be a lot of parties at our house. And uh, there's, I remember um, they'd give me sips of beer, and I remember thinking that was nasty, nasty, nasty. That ended up being my favorite drink of choice. I just love me some beer. Um, when uh, I, they told me I could go to church or not go to church, and I chose to go to church for a while because, I don't know, <laughs> seemed like the thing to do on Sundays. And uh, then I stopped going for no reason. Um, when I was 13, my mom died, and my dad was, oh gosh, nearing 70. And he didn't quite know what to do with a 13-year-old. We moved to, uh, in the meantime, we had moved to Jackson, just up the hill here, um, because we used to live in the Bay Area. And they moved me up there to keep me out of trouble, you know, save me from any trouble that the Bay Area might gain. And uh, what I what I can tell you about that is a small town. I didn't live in a big town, but when you live in a small town, you get in a hell of a lot more trouble, I think, than you do in a big city. I don't know. 
we, there was a lot of keggers and a lot of late night being truant. And, um, so I'm 13 and my dad's, uh, I'm bored. My dad goes to sleep at like six o'clock at night and he gets up at like four o'clock in the morning because he's old school and old. And, uh, <laughs> sorry, dad. <laughs> um, and I would be bored. And we lived out on uh, 88, which is the Highway 88, and, uh, about a mile from town. And just down the street, there was the, the cool dude that had all the, the cool in every aspect. And I'd start sneaking out and hanging out with him. And I tried just about everything there was to try. And um, thus began my journey. I uh, remember catching a name for myself in that town because it was very small and everybody talked. And then he put alcohol on me and I was very... Friendly, and uh, I, I lived with that name and that uh, reputation for a very long time, and I always felt less than. And I never really got along with any of my peers because my parents were older. Um, uh, whenever we went somewhere with with my parents, it was uh, it was always adults, so I didn't really hang out with anybody uh, my age. That stands today. That's been. A, the way it's been, my husband's 10 years older than me. Most of my friends are 10 years older than me. It's starting to really affect me now. I'm starting to think, God, you guys need to take a breath or something. Um, but because of that, I always felt like a little bit different. Um, in school, I got along better with the teachers. Uh, not to say that I got any good grades because I couldn't keep my yap shut in, in class, but um, I got along better with the teachers because they were adults. And... So all this to say is uh, I did some, you know, painful teenage years in, in Jackson. That's where I learned to drink. That's where I learned to party. Had a lot of fun. Went to a lot of keggers. Um, ended up in a lot of places I didn't necessarily mean to. I didn't think anything of it. It was partying. It was having a good time. Um, when I was, when I turned uh, 18, I was still in school because I'd missed a grade back in sixth grade. And... So I was writing my own notes for school. And I was making up all kinds of great, crazy notes to be late for school. So what that ended up in is um, me going into uh, independent school. But before that happened, while I was still writing the notes, I'd moved out. And um, we moved in. I moved into this place across the street from where I used to live with a, a guy named Tommy. He was a, he was a good friend. Um, me and my boyfriend moved in with him. And Tommy was a carpenter. And Tommy talked about God a lot. And Tommy talked about his belief a lot. But Tommy also did contradictory things to that. He smoked weed. He did, he did all kinds of other stuff. And he drank a lot. But you could tell he always talked about God a lot. And um, while that was very strange, it was just who Tommy was. And uh, one day... Um, he lived upstairs, and me and my boyfriend lived downstairs. And one day I thought he'd just been sleeping too long because he's normally up early. And so I went upstairs to find his head blown apart across the Bible. He'd used our gun. And um, shortly after that, my dad died. And that was the amount of death. That's all the death that I could have, and I can't stand no more. And um, all my family that I knew were older, too, and so they were going to start dying off any minute. So I kind of make a, made a conscious decision to step back. I'm, I'm full. I'm done. I can't. I ain't got no more. I'm shut down. You don't get any more from me. I don't know why it's just come to my attention or why it's been, things bubble up again. Um, I, I attended my dad's funeral. Don't remember it. There was ashes. Don't know where they are. Don't even know who to contact. I don't know why that's been bubbling back up again. I think I just heard a speaker talk about how he got to attend his family's uh, funeral. And it's something I, I wish I could change a little bit. Um, so some of the other things that I did were uh, I was always living on somebody's couch. I was a couch hopper. I was uh, just hanging out. I was always managed to keep a job, just barely. Um, I was always in front of somebody smiling, going, oh, I'll do better. It'll be okay. It'll be okay. I always managed to keep some kind of job. One of the jobs I ended up, uh, at, I would hear this conversation often, though. Can't you just get here on time? <laughs> so um, 
I did, I did, I was asked to leave one job because I had this watch that had the 12 mark only. And so it could be 7 o'clock, it could be 8 o'clock. And I came to work that day and they said, you know what, we love you. We just cannot put up with this anymore. Um, so I went home and uh, I was living on somebody's couch at that time. Uh, and I got in my car and I said, you know, i got a cousin somewhere down in San Diego. And I'm going to go find him. I haven't talked to him in years. Getting the whole family idea back again there for a second. And I went and visited and I was gone for like a month and a half and partied and did some crazy stuff. Um, the reason I bring that up is because there's other instances in my life where I'll just make a snap decision and I'll end up in some place like Louisiana or San Diego just because some cowboy or something like that asked me if I wanted to go to Louisiana the next day at a bar. Yeah, I want to go. Let's go. So, um, I started, uh, I'm working at this place called the Coffee House. Um, gosh, I was sleeping in my truck because it was big city. Sacramento was big city to me. And, uh, I was selling, actually, I was selling Kirby vacuum cleaners. And I didn't, um, I was sleeping in my truck and trying, trying to do this deal and partying all the time and ended up on somebody else's couch. And then I ended up uh, working at this place called Coffee House. And I worked there on and off for, oh, good Lord, I don't know, 10 years, something like that. Um, and it, uh, did a lot of partying, did a lot of drinking. It, there's a whole lot of area that I got in my life that is only hearsay because it's how I remember it. There's nobody to back me up and pull me aside and say, you know what, it didn't happen that way. So I don't know how bad it really got because I'm sure going to downplay it, all right? Um, what I remember, I got a lot of gray area. What I remember is always living on somebody's couch, always, uh, feeling like I missed something. There was a day in uh, my sophomore year, I think, the one of the turning points. And a lot of this stuff I didn't think about when it happened. It's only after I got here and I did the steps and I started to proceed on my recovery that I learned some of the turning points in my life. And one of the turning points I remember um, was we came back when, at school when I was still there uh, we went out to smoke at the tree, smoke and drink and whatever at the tree during lunch. And we came back and it was a history class. And the teacher, um, asked everybody in the room, who here plans on going to college? And some of these clowns that I was just with, that I would figure are degenerates like me or don't have any focus like me, raised their hands. And I thought, uh oh, I missed something. I missed some class that told us what to do next in life. And I remember feeling that way forever until I got here. And I remember thinking, yeah, and I'm too prideful to ask because I don't know. I'm just, I remember thinking, yep, damn, I missed something. So I'm partying. I'm ending up in a lot of places and just barely keeping a job. Um, and here's what happened. Because it's all gray. Anything I'd say past that is I'd be making something up. Um, I ended up getting married. And I'm still married to this day, unbelievably. And uh, I started uh, working back. I worked back and forth at this place for a long time. And I thought, okay, this is going to fix me. I, okay, it's time for me to settle down. And I was like 25, 28, I think. I was 28 when I got married. I thought, okay, this is what I needed. Okay, it's time for me to stop partying. I'll settle down. I'll get me a husband. And I'll get me, came with 2.5 kids. And, okay, I had my fun. Now let's do this. And it was great, and it held my attention for a minute. And uh, he's older, and he's a little more set in his ways, and I want to play still. And he just wants to sit, and I'm bored. So eventually I go out, and I start partying again. And I start hanging out with people that... Um, it, well, anyway, I, I went to work this one day at this place called the Copy House, and I'd been out partying the night before all night long because I chose to pick a fight, pa- picked a fight with my husband, and so I could go out and party. And I went to work the next day with the same clothes and whatever. Um, and the next thing I know is I'm getting tapped on my shoulder, and I'd gone. This is a twenty-five thousand square foot building, and there was paint stacks and stacks of, of paper in the back. We used to hide back there and sleep on. There'd be it was a paper 
printing company. So there'd be huge bags of popcorn, like 20 foot by seven foot bags of popcorn that we used to go back there and sleep on. And, um, I was back there apparently talking to the machines, I guess, like that's a bad thing. <laughs> I don't know. But they tapped me on the shoulder and, um, <clears throat> they wanted me to test for stuff. And, uh, I ended up testing positive for everything they tested me for. And here's what happened. Here's my next, my next moment that I really remember is I'm having this long walk from the back of the building up to the boss's office. And I'm having two distinct feelings occupying my body at the same time. One is, oh, I am not going to get out of this one. There's been one too many times when my name has been brought up, where I've been late, where I've been absent, where I've been something. I'm not going to get out of this one. Something's going to have to change. And the other one was, I'm not going to get out of this one. Something's going to have to change. Because I remember feeling tired of um, trying to remember if I've wiped off the toilet lid in the bathroom of any other substance that I was trying to make my life go with. I remember being tired of trying to run my lunches, okay, so I'd get that whole lunch thing going on where I'm going to go meet to connect, and I'd get that, you know, oh, my God, it's stress, and i got to be in this time frame. Or I'd go across the street to my favorite bar, F&B's, and they got two size beers. they got one this size, which is pointless, and one this size. And so i got to make sure that i got enough money for this size because this size, remember, is pointless. And um, Or if i got my game on enough to make sure that you notice me so you'll buy me this size. Um, and then have enough money maybe for a little bit of food, too, to add. Because uh, if you get a burger, you can get a lot of onion on it that will cover up the beer breath, right? Um, making sure that I got enough gum or what have you. Going in and making sure that I'm all clean in the bathroom before I go back to work. <sighs> Something's going to have to change. And uh, one more time, here I am going up to the boss's office, and I'm sitting on the other side of somebody's desk in authority, and uh, I'm in trouble this time. They want me to go test for stuff. So they, what they told me was they told me to go away, get clean, and come back. And uh, I think a lot of times what we hear is just go away. I, I don't know. I skated through a lot of stuff. Um, they, they had a charter outpatient deal, and I went to charter... Uh, I don't know, it seemed like a million years. It was an outpatient deal that I went to a lot. I'd never, ever heard of Alcoholics Anonymous before in my life. I didn't know what an alcoholic was. Um, and I went to this thing, and I went in my brain to quit the drugs. Um, but I quit the alcohol, too, because I knew... I mean, I called that my main reason for going. But I knew somewhere deep down inside that it was, my drinking wasn't normal. Because at this point, I was getting up, not really thinking anything about it, but I was getting up in the middle of the night to drink and watch TV, because so he won't see. I was um, doing things like, uh, we had, okay, 12-pack, right? And my shoulder drop was four beers, where where I could breathe again. Well, you line the beers up in such a way, you get a 12-pack and a half or something like that, and you line them up in fours, drink the four, recap them, put them in the back, put the empty ones in the back, Move it forward, take two more, because if four is good, start with six. So he only thinks I'm having two. Yeah, I thought somewhere along the line that probably wasn't normal drinking, to hide it outside in a piece of old furniture. At this point, I'm starting, something's nagging at me, that something's not quite right about that. And then, you know, to have to make sure that I pre-drink enough before I get to the restaurant so I can have the two that will equal the four that will equal the shoulder drop so I can breathe and so I don't get that look of like, oh, really? So Charter Outpatient Hospital, I still have my, I did the whole program. I had no problem saying I was an alcoholic. Um, and I got that feeling of what goes on here. Where are the steps? I'm not here. Um, I saw the steps on the wall and I, uh, God, I had denounced a long time ago because God killed everybody I loved, right? So I didn't know what to do with that word. Um, and I didn't pray to anything or believe in anything. Um, but I saw those steps and I thought, gosh, I bet you a couple of those are going to require a little bit of work. And I remember, I remember two years after I actually got sober, um, that I'd gone home and I told my husband, wow, apparently my whole life's going to change. If you're new, it will not if you don't do anything about that. If you just say those words and you do no action, it will not. <laughs> just saying. Um, so I did the uh, outpatient, 
and I graduated, and the people from my work came, and they congratulated me, and uh, I kept waiting for them to drug test me, and they never did again, and um, it was different, and that was a new new life for me. So we were in a motorcycle club, and we hung out, and we went on poker runs, and when you go to poker runs, you stop at a bar to pick up the cards, and the Coke eventually turned into an all duels, eventually turned into beer at home, and um, eventually turned into... Uh, the next moment that I pretty much remember was me sitting in my living room floor. My marriage was in shambles, shortly to be at least destroyed. Um, and I'm sitting in the living room floor, uh, and it's dark. And I, I'm i pretty sure I drank and dialed her, but I was talking on the phone with a woman who's wrecking my life. And she says, um, you know what, I feel sorry for you, you pathetic drunk. And I don't know why that hit me, but it did. Um, and I imagined a vat. I don't even think I've ever seen a vat, but I imagined a vat of alcohol and just beer just swimming in it and just trying to drink, 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 drink. And that's what I proceeded to start to do is um, just drown all that out. I didn't know that's what I was doing, but all I, wanted, all I knew is that I just wanted to drink and I just wanted to shut it up. So there was a period of time from that. Uh, I, they told me to go to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous after the charter deal. Um, they told me to go to meetings, and here's what I can tell you: is that um, I went to the outpatient, the after, the aftercare. Sorry, let me digress a minute. There was this woman that would come in, and they'd have speakers come in and talk, right? And she came in, and she leaned against the doorway, and she says, "Hi, I'm so and so, and I'm clean and sober for four years." And I'm thinking, "So freaking what? Are you kidding me? <laughs> Who wants to say that out loud?" <laughs> And you, she's got a, that's a fake smile. I know it is. You know you ain't camping no more. You know that you ain't dancing no more. You know you're really not that happy. And I remember feeling that. I remember thinking, that's crap. I've seen her. I just got to see her during the spring fling and she's still sober. And that was just like a, an amazing thing to me. Um, but I remember thinking how bullshit that sounded and how crazy that would be that you would say that out loud. Um, so they told me to go to meetings about Alcoholics Anonymous. And, um, I, Somewhere along the line had gotten the idea that an alcoholic was trench coat, bag, beer in a can, um, dirty railroad. Don't know where I got that. Uh, unfortunately, my very first meeting was um, at Roseville Tuesday Night Club, which um, is near railroad tracks. <laughs> and when I walked in there, that's what I saw. That's not what was sitting there, but that's what I saw. And so I waited until the speaker, la- the speaker stopped talking, and at the very first moment that I could, I bolted. And uh, the next place that I went to was I went over to, because I lived up in this area, and I went over to uh, Fifth Street, and I went in the wrong door. I went in the clubhouse door. And I sat on the couch, and I saw the coffee bar, and I saw the pool table, and nobody came up on me, and I sat on the edge, the very edge of that couch for just half a minute and went, what is going on here? <laughs> nobody came up to me, and, it, and so I left. Those were that was my experience of alcohol. It's not so I do not consider myself a retread because I didn't even give it a half a minute. So I did something for about two and a half years, which compiled resulted in me sitting on my living room floor. And so here I am going to try to drink, 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 shut it up. And um, I just started this new job. Now I get to the fun part. I just started this new job. Um, and how I got this job was uh, I'd been let go from the other job because they were downsizing or whatever. And I went that day. It was a Friday. Because I got I got I run my mouth a lot and I got a lot of connections. So I knew that if I ever lost a job, I, there were people there was people I was going to call. So I went to the bar, opened up the phone book, ordered me some beers, and started calling these people. And had a job before I left the bar, which I was impressed with. Um, he said. Uh, Okay, fax me your resume. And so I went home with my big, tall can in a bag, sat in front of the window and faxed my resume. And he called me back and says, okay, can you come down right now? No, not so much. So <laughs> I said, I'll be there Monday. And that was, um, that was the beginning, that was uh, the end of April. And... Um, I don't remember what day it was. It must have been during. It must have been a Monday that I started. I don't know. But um, March first, I was leaving. Uh, 
I just started there in February. Sorry. I started there in February, and I did this month, right? So I've got this month at this new job, and I'm trying to hold it together. And this is a brand new deal for me. I've done copying. I've never done printing. This was all new to me. Um, and so I'm doing this month there, and I'm starting to frequent this new bar, Players Club, over on Fair Oaks. Um, so it finds me leaving the bar because I'd used everybody in the bar. I wasn't used to being in a bar anymore. I used to know how to do it, but I've been married too long, and I didn't know how to work the guys anymore. And I got this new job, so I got that pay lag. And um, so I'm leaving the bar, and I remember pulling out, and I remember thinking, okay, i got to stop going to this bar because I've been here like three days, three or four days in a row, and kind of like a hanger on, and they're really starting to notice me, and I, where am I going to go? Oh, how many am I going to tell him I had? I'll screw him anyway. I'm mad at him. That's right. I really got to pull it together because I got this new job, Betty. you got to get to work on time. And is there a cop behind me? Oh, my God. I'm so tired. I am so tired. Is it always going to be like this? I remember feeling so weary of just always feeling like I'm juggling and working it. And I have no idea why, but I picked up the phone and I dialed out all these songs. And this woman talked to me all the way home, and she told me where there was a meeting the next day. And I always get like this because I remember that moment. Like nothing, I remember that whole... Um, and I know what I feel like today and it always causes this so she told me where there was a meeting the next day and uh, I went to that meeting and it was over at uh, Gibbons and it was a large meeting and there was like a million years of sobriety in that room and that was fantastic and terrifying at the same time and I went from one week to the next to the next I think don't know I can't remember, um, but I remember I ended up trying, because I didn't know there was a million meetings of alcoholic sonos here every week, every day, um, and I didn't get a schedule for like three weeks, something like that, but I tried to, ended up trying a women's meeting, and uh, there was a million years of sobriety in that room too, and I thought, well, maybe that's what I needed, was a women's meeting. Uh, no, I currently hated women, so that probably wasn't a good idea. And then I tried uh, this meeting that I kind of felt a little bit comfortable in because they were older folks. I thought, okay, I get that, I get that. And I I listened a couple of times and I thought, well, that's not really, you know, that's not my time frame. I understand them, but it's not quite my time frame, and I didn't have the same experience. Somehow I ended up with a schedule. And I tell you what, at that meeting, at those first few meetings, ain't nobody came up on me and said nothing. I was on the edge and I was locked up and... Nobody came up on me and said nothing. I don't know how I ended up with the schedule, but I did. And this, I searched the book, and I remember feeling so unfamiliar. This is so unfamiliar to me. I don't know if this is what I need or want or anything like that. Um, all I know is that I did not drink from that very first day. I don't know if I heard you guys say that, but I didn't. So there was a meeting near my house. And uh, this meeting met six times a day or something like that. And me and him ain't talking, right? So I need something to do with my time. I'm really going to focus at this job, so I'm trying to be there. And uh, so I drive there, and I circle the parking lot a little bit, and I park way over there, and I watch everybody walk down the breezeway, and I hear the laughter, and I sit in my car, and I wait until everybody goes inside. And... Um, sat in my car, and uh, it was a breezeway that you had to walk down, and there was two windows alongside the door that had Venetian blinds on it, and I waited until everybody went inside, and then I walked up to the door, and I'm trying to peek in the Venetian blinds, and I don't see anything, and uh, I turned around and I left, and I got halfway home, and to this day, I have no idea why, but I turned around and I came back, and I parked my damn car, and I went and I sat in the room, and I sat in the front, because I didn't know you could sit in the back and half measure this shit. And I don't know what I heard. Um, <sighs> so I started to make that my home group. And how I did that was I kept showing up. Um, 
So what happened was uh, they met six times a day. And so I'd show up and I'd show up and um, I don't know what I'm doing and I don't understand. I don't understand this group. This group is a rough looking group and uh, actually what I heard in that very first meeting that allowed me to stay was uh, the chairperson said, ma, 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 something, right? I don't hear nothing. Um, and after he spoke, he called on somebody in the back. And uh, he said, hey, so-and-so, how you doing? And the guy in the back said, I don't know, but one of these fucking lines in my forehead going to go away. And he said, fuck and God in the same sentence. And people did not get up and throw him out. And I didn't understand that. I understood the feeling. Little Miss locked up tight with my leg going and everything about me screaming, stay the hell away from me, but everything else about me saying, somebody please help me, understood those emotions that he was saying. Didn't understand why he wasn't either getting struck dead or people weren't getting up and throwing him out. All I know was my insides wanted to do this. And it, everybody was like, okay with it. So I never worry about anything I see, chasing anybody out of Alcoholics Anonymous, because I never know what's going to make somebody stay. For me, it was that. So you guys surround me. You guys tell me, keep coming back. And, okay, whatever. Here's a book. Okay, whatever. All I know is that for some reason I show up. And here's what I found out is the, the longer that I'm here, the more amazed I am that I left everything that I knew outside the door of that first meeting um, and believed everything you guys said when I came in. Because here's what it was. It was uh, this home group. There was all kinds of crazy people in this home group. There was people sleeping on the couch. These couches were nasty. There was people with suit and ties coming in. There was people saying curse words. There was people saying nice things. There was male, female, black, white, homeless, not. And everybody had this same kind of stuff coming out of their eyes. And the same kind of aura about them of <sighs> that shoulder drop. And that's what I experienced here in Alcoholics Anonymous was I experienced that shoulder drop, that four-beer shoulder drop. I got immediate relief from Alcoholics Anonymous. And I felt better every time I left. So it wasn't um, rocket science for me to figure out, okay, I'll go see what this is. Pretty soon it started showing up enough to where you guys say, hey, babe, how's it going? It's good to see you. <laughs> And I, then you guys stood me at the door and you guys told me to greet. And I'm like, I don't, I don't want to do that, but I don't, I don't know what it is driving me to say, okay, I just do it, right? And so I stand there at that door and I say, hi, how you doing? And, and after a few weeks, my eyes come up just a little bit and search you out just a little bit because I'm, I'm feeling like a failure at life, right? My mat, my marriage is in shit. I never really finished school. I never really, always barely holding on to a job. You guys are making me feel like I'm not. And I don't understand and I don't know how to do that. So my eyes start to come up a little bit. And pretty soon I start to know your name a little bit. And it's effort, result, effort, result, effort, result. And that's what I've learned here is that if I apply the effort, I get the result. And some amazing things have happened as a result of that. You guys told me to pray for this woman that was wrecking my life. Because I had no better ideas, and because I had no, um, because I got immediate relief from it being in here, I did that. I didn't know what I was praying to, I didn't have a God that I believed in. Um, so I prayed for something. And if you're new here, please be careful what you pray for, because you may get it. This particular little bit of information I didn't necessarily want. Um, but I knew that result was a, I knew that was a direct result of doing that effort, and it scared me a little bit. So I thought, all right, what else you guys got? So I've been pushing that ever since. My um, next defining moment that I remember is, is I'm sitting at the birthday the birthday table on birthday night and I really purple purple's my favorite color and all I wanted was that purple chip and the birthday person would sit to me over there and say one more month Betty 
one more month or two more months or two more weeks or whatever it was. She'd say, you're almost there. You almost got your chip. And uh, what Alcoholics Anonymous has been able to do for me is I can breathe here. I can absolutely breathe here. Um, Alcoholics Anonymous has been the only thing I've been absolutely sure in. I don't necessarily know how to do my job really well. I don't necessarily know how to do marriage that well, better now, um, or being social or anything like that. Here, I know in my heart that I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing here. Um, so what started happening was I started participating because I get a buzz. I'm a pig for the buzz. Um, and what I started getting was I started feeling more whole than I ever had in my whole life. And um, you guys started looking me in the eyes, and I started for half a second feeling worthy of looking you back in the eyes. And you guys would welcome me back in and say, hey, Betty, how's it going? Hey, why don't you go talk to this newcomer? Huh? I don't want to do that. So um, I did the steps, uh, and I withheld something on my fifth step until that last 59th minute that I went home. And I decided that I wanted to be free more than I cared about that secret being said. And I remember um, calling her up at the last, very last minute and spilling that. And she goes, oh, okay, well, remember that, you know, it's something to do so it injured them or others. And I'm like, oh. That was one of my freeing points right there where I just decided, okay, I get way more relief here and I don't want to, I don't want that, uh, I don't want to be like this anymore. So I did the steps and I chased my sponsor. And I chased all my sponsors. I absolutely insist on being actively sponsored. Not that I can't do my life. I don't want I don't want the ideas that I had before I got here. Because it doesn't take a rocket science to figure out my life is a million times better, okay? From here to here, where it counts. When I got here I had this big black hole that nothing could fill. And I didn't feel worthy and I didn't feel like I fit in until I got here. And by doing all these little silly actions, like looking you in the eye, greeting the newcomer, um, opening up my big books with my new clown so you could read me this old, old, old stuff, I started to feel relief. My shoulder dropped. And uh, uh, like I said, I'm a pig for the buzz. And Alcoholics Anonymous has given me the biggest buzz I've ever gotten in my whole life. Um, at year four, I finally got to feel full of love. All that love that I'd searched my whole life that I felt I'd missed. At one night during my home group, a birthday night, people were coming up to me and they're saying, we love you, we respect you. And for the first time, I finally went, okay. And I was full. And I didn't feel that need to search for that thing, that whatever it was that I was lacking to fill me anymore. And so now I can really fully start giving back. I've uh, never left the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. I've always been really, really close. I've always done a hell of a lot of meetings because I love it here. And I can breathe here and I function way better out there. I stayed, I still got, I still had that job up until last year. And that boss would come to every one of my birthdays. He's not one of us. He would come to every one of our birthdays because apparently I made a big impression on him that first month that I was still drinking. Um, <laughs> he'd be quick to tell you that too. He said, you were a mess. And he came, I think, for my first eight years to my birthdays. And I think I, I, I asked him to give me my eight-year chip, and that was awesome. Uh, year six and seven, uh, started feeling a little strange, like I hadn't, like year seven I felt like I didn't become the person that I thought I was gonna be. And, uh, so what did I do? Um, I just dug into helping others more. I always wanted to sponsor people. Um, I am very passionate about the program of Alcoholics Anonymous and, about not half-assing it and about effort results and um, it's about it not being okay if you don't do the effort. So you only attract a certain kind of people like that and the people that don't really want to work don't really slide up next to me. <laughs> um, so, uh, but I, I kept trying and I'm always service, 12-step uh, work is so many different areas. 
not just greeting the newcomer, not just making coffee, showing up on a regular basis. For those of you that are here with multiple years, thank you. I couldn't be here standing here if you weren't. Uh, Because if you didn't show up on a regular basis and show me at 15 years that you still like to go to meetings, you're still happy, you're still uh, of service, what what do I want with that? Um, I was a secretary of my home group many times, and uh, year seven, like I said, it started to feel like I wasn't the person I thought I was going to be. I guess I thought I was going to be some kind of Betty Crocker hippie kind of person, I don't know. Um, but I didn't turn out to be that. All of a sudden I had more shoes and hair products than I ever thought I was going to have, and I thought I sold out, right? <laughs> swear to God. I'm like, I'm doing my hair, and I'm like, what? I was going to be a hippie. What happened here? <laughs> In the meantime, I'd, I'd gathered all this hostage stuff that I'd had, that I'd carried all my life that defined who I was because that's all that I had. And I'm looking at this stuff, that I've graciously carried with me, and it doesn't define me anymore because I am someone now, someone of worth, that I'm a productive member of society and my home group and such as that. And I'm looking at this stuff, and I feel like a, a traitor because it's not me anymore. And so I went through some grieving pains with that and let go of it, and I got to say, I got to say thank you for bringing me there, and I got to say goodbye with it. Um, this whole, the rest of this time, around that time, I found general service. And uh, there's a whole new playground to play in. General service is awesome. It was just the thing that I needed. I had no idea that Alcoholics Anonymous runs on a shoestring and a couple people behind the scenes. And uh, I got to be GSR of my group. And I, I did that commitment, I think, I, for a while. And then I'm um, currently an uh, alternate DCM for our district. Um, So last year I had like nine sponsees and today I got one. So that's just the way it works. Um, I'm grateful for any time any of them will slide up next to me and stay because it allows me to be in the book. And that's what I chase is I chase talking out of the book, hanging out with people that are in the book. Um, I am on my fifth sponsor. just happens because I want to be actively sponsored. Um, I just got a, a brand new job. I had an idea. Here's a, here we go. I got. <laughs> I was blessed to be able to go to an international conference last year, and we took a trip all the way over there. We drove over there, and my husband and I fell in love with Arizona when we came back, and we stayed over there a little bit. And we decided we don't have anything holding us here, so we're gonna we're gonna start making plans to move to Arizona. And this was like new and big, and we're both ready to play somewhere else. And I'm I'm good, good. I'm already making contacts over there with AA. And so I get this idea. Oh, during this trip, they found out, my work found out that they could live without me because he paid me very well, and I wasn't doing that good of a job anymore. But um, they found out they could live without me, so I was unemployed. And so it just kind of coincided properly that not only were we losing my house because we didn't have the money from the paycheck, but we decided to move anyway. So now we're going to sell the house, and we're going to move. And uh, I was unemployed for a little while, and then I decided, hmm, I don't know why. I'm going to go I'm gonna go to work at U-Haul, because U-Haul is based in Phoenix. And so I'm going to go get a job there. I'm going to get a good customer service job, and then I'm going to be able to transfer. God's got different plans. Um, and all I know to do is put one foot in front of the other. They made me manager in like a record time. And here I am trying to, I've never done any of that. I'm grateful for the opportunity. Um, it's frightening and terrifying and frantic and crazy and all those emotions we try to stay away from. And so what did I do is I made sure my sponsor knew exactly what I'm doing at all times. You know, so I'm actively sponsored. Um, I made sure my sponsees know know what's going on, and I make sure that I can talk to them on a regular basis. Um, so when I start to get crazy, it helps keep me on an even keel. So I'm uh, doing some new stuff in life, and uh, it wasn't my plan. So we'll, we'll, now, of course, the house is sold. <laughs> so we'll have to do an interim move. And okay. Two years ago, I would have been a frantic mess over it. 
Here's what I can tell you about, um, the benefit of time is time. <laughs> you, you get, if you get to stay, you get to not be as crazy over stuff anymore. I would have been absolutely crazy about all that, trying to manage it. And today I'm like, okay, whatever's the next thing. I'm just here to be of service. There was a speaker that said everything boils down to love and service. Absolutely everything boils down to love and service. And I love to run that around my head because every once in a while I think I'll get an idea that it doesn't. But if you break it all down, it all does boil down to love and service one way or another. And uh, so I'm grateful for the opportunity to be of service to not only myself but to the community and to this. And... Um, There's so many different ways to be of service and carry our 12th suggestion. And that is by being an example, the best that you can be, whatever, we're all human, we all have hypocrisies going on, we all have sometimes look real good, sometimes we all look real bad. And the only thing that I know is um, I don't care what I look like as long as I don't have to take another drink, as long as I don't have to feel that way that I did from here to here, because from here to here is cured. Now, uh, it's filled with the action that I do. An old man named Jerry uh, scared me into praying um, in my home group. He 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 said uh, he said the same thing every day. I only heard it that once. He said, "Pray before you pee, get up, smoke a cigarette, or anything." And um, I was still new enough to where I was listening to everything, still listening to everything. But I was he swiveled his head at me that one day when he said it. And I was like, "Okay." So uh, thank you, Jerry C., who's no longer with us, that scared me into praying every day, and I pray out loud. Um, and I'm grateful to say that I have a God in my life today uh, that I that I connect with on a regular basis. Um, all I know is that it's not me, and I know that it's, it's changed. My God has changed as I've gone through my sobriety. And um, I think the change, all kinds of change for us is okay. Um, I think that means we're growing. For me, it does. Uh, it means that I'm growing. And so when I get, um, I don't want to ever get too comfortable because that scares me worse than anything, getting too comfortable because I'll get an idea. And if I'm not actively sponsored, I might act on that. And I don't want to do that because from here to here is good. So um, for anybody that's new here to Alcoholics Anonymous, all I can say is, Hook up with somebody that's got that light shining out of their eyes. Hook up with somebody who has what they want. Because if they've got what they want, they can show you how to get what you want. In here, I'm not talking about the outside stuff. Because you can give me all that outside stuff. It don't mean nothing if I ain't right from here to here. If I can't, if I can't sit in a room, if I can look good sitting in a room and not breathe, I don't care. If I can look like a trash monkey sitting in a room but I can breathe, it's all good. And that's one thing that I love about Alcoholics Anonymous is I can be here and I can breathe and I can be whatever state of life that I'm in. Um, so get with somebody that's got that light shining out of their eyes. Get with somebody that's carrying a big book. I absolutely honor this group because of their commitment to sponsorship and being in the big book. And whenever I really needed to come study the big book, I don't get here as, as often as I'd like, but whenever I needed to come study the big book, this was always a great opportunity for me to do so. So I'd like to say thank you for allowing me to participate in my own sobriety today. Have a rocking day. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.